Well, folks, it is May... Uh, what is the date? It's May 19, Wednesday, and this is the Daily Word. Well, you know, it doesn't take a prophet or some level of great spirituality to know that at no time in the last several decades has warfare in the realm of the spirit been more intense. On the one hand, there are the passionate, Bible-grounded Christians facing off the demonic powers of the world. On the other, so you get two sides. Bible-grounded Christians, demonic powers of the world. That would be Ephesians 6.10 and the verses after it. We're going to come to that in just a minute. On the other hand, closer to home, uh, among confessing Christians, the scene seems to be, it seems to increasingly resemble something like the American Civil War. You have two or more sides. All Americans, each side acknowledging God and praying to him, each side claiming it fights on the right side, the side of God, while one side obviously is in the wrong. Brother fights against brother, and there are significant casualties. At the same time, just as in the Civil War, <clears throat> atrocities are committed on both sides. Accusations fly, hateful things are said, and enormous damage is done. On and on it goes. Well, in the first century, the Apostle Paul saw the battle lines as much more clearly defined. On the one hand, on the one side, were the Christians dedicated to Jesus, while on the other side, there was hostile Jewish opposition that often incited the Roman government to acts of vicious and deadly persecution. So Christians were attacked on two fronts. Behind it all was a powerful demonic influence. <clears throat> and so starting in Ephesians 6.10, the apostle addressed it this way, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So Paul painted a picture of ruling demonic forces. The Greek word is arche. Ruling demonic forces, presiding over sub-commanders, that's the powers, who then commanded armies of demonic foot soldiers, that's the spiritual forces of wickedness. He saw the powers of darkness as being well organized and full of purpose. He took care not to identify people influenced by those forces as the enemy, but rather the demonic forces that inspired them. And so he didn't label human rulers of the hostile synagogues or pagan rulers, pagan Roman rulers as enemies. He knew you don't win for the kingdom of God by seeing the people you desire to win as your enemies. Then he spoke of schema, schemes, schema in the Greek, schemes of the devil. Well laid plans, carefully woven webs of deception designed to enlist human beings in carrying out their plans for destruction. Well, do I really need to tell you which human agencies and institutions have been enlisted to confuse, delude, and entrap people in our day? And ultimately to bring about opposition to Christians and to the infallible eternal word of God that's handed down to us by the prophets and apostles in Scripture? After verses 10 and 11, the apostle wrote about the armor of God we all need to take on ourselves. Now listen, this is no mystical, multifaceted set of battle armor hanging in the spiritual closet that we can somehow take off at night and then put on in the morning. Each element of the armor is, is a symbol standing for some element of the character of our Lord imprinted into us. The enemy then sees the nature of Jesus in us and cannot successfully press his attack. I won't take the time here to examine each piece of that armor and and the character it represents, it would take too long. And there's another issue that I want to emphasize. For now, let me say that the call for repentance and cleansing that some of us have been prophetically trumpeting in recent years becomes absolutely essential to having solid armor in place in this time of intense spiritual warfare. God has sown any number of good inner healing and transformation ministries into the body of Christ, <clears throat> that are designed to ferret out our judgments, 
our unforgivenesses, our unholy strongholds and habits of thought, and more, in order to cleanse us and establish not just holiness, but wholeness in our lives. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> all for the sake of the kingdom of God. All for the sake of effective witness. <clears throat> oh, wow. Effective witness to the gospel of Jesus. Well, I want no chinks in my armor that the enemy of my soul can access and use to destroy me, my ministry, and those around me. Now, here's the key thing I want to emphasize today. The apostle wrote in Ephesians 6, 18, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Well, that's military language. On the alert. The principle here is that God never called us to fight alone, never called us to fight in isolation. No army can win that doesn't fight as a team, each one watching out for the other next to him or her. In fact, a key objective of any attacking army is to break the line of the army they're attacking. It's to open a breach in the connection of the warriors one to another and separate them so that the attacking army can break through, separate, and destroy. So we're called to a consistent, listen to me, we're called to a consistent depth of relationship with one another such that we are immediately aware when a brother or sister weakens or falters. We need to be alert to when a fellow member of the body of Christ is being accessed by delusion or the spirit of negativity or criticism that ultimately divides believers and breaks up fellowships. We need to be close enough to be aware when someone is depressed or not physically well or experiencing a material need and never falter in praying over those things for our brothers and sisters as the enemy of our soul seeks out weaknesses to exploit. We have been embroiled in an extended season when the enemy of our soul has sought to break our lines, to break up and isolate believers from one another through government-mandated church closures in the name of a public health emergency. Churches and pastors have been fined for daring to meet. In some nations, authorities have arrested pastors, erected fences to keep people out, or sent locksmiths to change locks to keep believers out of their buildings. Yes, this virus, with its restrictions on churches, has been demonically inspired. Yes, this, the, the virus was and is real, I'm not denying that, but the spiritual hosts of wickedness have gleefully exploited the situation to inspire governments to go well beyond what is reasonable or even constitutionally legal. But those government leaders are just people Jesus died to save. They're not the focus of our struggle. They're not the enemy. The virus is demonically inspired, as are the draconian measures put in place to control it. Those demonic powers must be the focus of our warfare and prayer. And in the midst of it, we need to combat the massive fear-mongering that has imprisoned so many, even among believers in Jesus. And now I'm back to that connection again. Be on the alert for all the saints. Cover them. Pray for minds and hearts to be freed from the fear. Pray for the breaking of the depression that has settled on so many and affected their lives in such a negative way. And above all, saints, regather its time. Ancient warriors, ancient warriors would lock shields to form a shield wall. When the enemy attacked and ran up against that shield wall, the defenders would thrust their swords from between their protective interlocked shields to destroy the attackers. Listen, we fight in oneness, shields locked in this spiritual battle, and we win. Or we continue in isolation or in tearing one another apart over issues that are not central issues of salvation, and so we lose the battle. And finally, the apostle made a personal appeal. He wrote this letter while he was under house arrest in Rome, awaiting his appeal to the emperor. Hence the reference to being an ambassador in chains, imprisoned, but not silenced in his representation of who Jesus is. Here's the verse, verse 19. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, 
that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So I appeal to my fellow pastors to speak boldly the truth of the gospel and its implications. Lose the fear of the people's reaction. Preach the word of God, not what you think might build your church, and not from fear of losing people if you offend them. Truth can be spoken in love, but that never means that we water it down or diminish the force of what God has given us in his eternal word. So pray for the pastors in our nation. Pray for courage to speak. Pray for boldness. Pastoring is one of the top three most stressful professions a man can hold. Or a woman. Our pastoral leaders need the prayers of the people they've been charged with leading. Well, that's it for today. Saints, go to war. But do it right. God bless you.